Hey everyone, uh, it's been great getting to meet all of you guys. Uh, I'm Andrew Cassell. Uh, I, and I want to first thank all of the organizers uh, for putting on PHP Serbia. Fantastic conference. I'm uh, so happy to be here making this horrible noise. So, uh, for those of you who don't know me yet, I'm from the United States. I live in a suburb of Washington, D.C., where I'm an organizer of the D.C. PHP uh, meetup. And uh, for the last 10 years or so, almost, uh, I've been writing PHP applications at a company called the Marine Spill Response Corporation, which is a uh, nonprofit that cleans up oil spills. Uh, I work as uh, part of a small in house development team with two other extremely, extremely talented developers. Uh, and I only say that because I think this talk may end up on YouTube, so in case they watch it later. But, um, you know, we, we build PHP applications that uh, our organization uses to respond to oil spills and natural disasters. So, why, why are you here today? Why, why am I here today? And I assume it's because we all want to be better developers. We want to become better code craftsmen. We want to raise the level of our code. We want to become a more mature developer, whether that's go from junior to senior, from senior and on up. We want to have a better understanding of the problems that we're trying to solve. We want to give a better value to your clients, your bosses, and your customers. The thing I'm here to talk to you about today is domain-driven design. And it's oftentimes called DDD, so for those of you who don't know it. Real quick survey, who has heard about domain-driven design, DDD? Good, quite a bit. I, I'm not going to change the slides at all, I, I already started. but. <laughs> Good to hear that a lot of you already know where we're going. So the bulk of the information of this talk comes from two books. Um, they're oftentimes refer referred to the, as the blue book and the red book. I know the color here is a little messed up. Uh, the blue book by Eric Evans, Domain Driven Design, that's like the Old Testament of Domain Driven Design. Um, it was originally released, I think, in 2004, and uh, it, is the, uh, it lays the whole plan out for Domain Driven Design. Uh, a little bit later, uh, Von Vernon wrote the uh, Implementing Domain-Driven Design. Uh, that's like the New Testament in DDD land. Um, kind of m a little more practical uh, in how to apply things. Uh, but, I mean, since these two books have come out, there's been many more people who have applied Domain-Driven Design, and a lot of things have changed. So there, there's been more and more books that have come out with patterns and principles being one that is a very deep dive into how to do it, and then a lot of small um, Cliff Notes versions. So if you're the kind of person who only goes to church at Christmas and Easter, um, these are probably the books for you. All the patterns I'm going to talk about today are not new. They've been around for a long time. Uh, these are two uh, famous books on patterns and software architecture. Um, all of the talk information, all the stuff from DDD comes from these books for the most part. And one more thing, um, just to thank uh, Matthias Veres and Bo Simonson. Um, they've been two uh, big proponents of DVD in the PHP community, PHP community, and without them, I probably would, wouldn't be doing this. Okay. So, for those of you who have never heard of domain-driven design, or maybe you just read the Wikipedia definition, um, DDD is about focusing on the core business problem that you're trying to solve and developing a valuable collaboration with other people who hold a stake in the success of your products, and modeling your software in a way that is both understandable and maintainable. Now, DDD is meant to handle really complicated problems, like assembling IKEA furniture. Because what it'll do, it'll break the domain model down into something that's understandable and easily maintainable. Now, one of the things in domain-driven design that's very important is object-oriented programming. If you don't have a good understanding of object-oriented programming, you're not going to go very far with it. And when I mean object-oriented programming, I don't mean about cars barking or dogs driving, which we use first, usually the first thing we learn in object-oriented programming. When we refer to object-oriented programming, 
refer to the, the behavior of the objects, not just uh, the methods on them. So the first thing I want to talk about with you guys is the first word in domain-driven design, the domain. And when I say domain, uh, I refer to the problem uh, that you're trying to solve, or the problem space. For me, uh, my domain is you know, oil spill response and vessels and ships and everything like that, and I don't want to have to tell you all about that. So for today's example, we're going to choose something that we all know, um, which is a library, which I've heard still exists. They still have books that you can take out. Um, so let's imagine that we're going to build software for a library. And, you know, it, we're obviously going to have books in the library, so we're going to need a book database, ta a table in our database. And we're going to have users, so we're going to need a user table. And the users and the books, the book's going to have, a, you're going to have inventory of books, so you're going to have a book inventory table. And then users are going to take out books, so we're going to have a book inventory user link. And if you're a Symfony developer out there, you're already thinking, oh, who's going to be the role user? Well, that's going to be probably the librarian. Or who's going to be the role admin? Well, that's the librarian. Or oh, we need to solve the problem of logins, so we're going to need OAuth, and maybe we're going to use, like he was saying earlier, we're going to use NoSQL. Just, just stop. Slow down. <laughs> Our developer reptile brains, that we, uh, as soon as we hear a problem, we immediately have a solution before we've heard the rest of the problem, and what is actually the problem that needs solving. So while I'm not saying that implementation is not important, but choosing the right framework can make a big difference in a project, but we have to really analyze the problem that we're trying to solve before we jump right in and start coding. There's a saying from the uh, jobs to be done community that people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill. They want a quarter inch hole. People are not paying you for your software. They're paying you to solve their, their problems. What is the problem space? Is your problem actually worth solving? Do people just randomly drop their phones? No. <laughs> Make sure the problem you solve is actually worthwhile to solve in the first place. You know, reminding ourselves that um, our jobs as developers is either to make our company a pile of money or save our company a pile of money. So maybe writing our own DI containers, and writing our own frameworks, or writing our own session management, or logins, or password resets, stuff like that is, is, is really not important. What we're being paid for is to focus on the core business problems. And I think that's where a lot of developers need a lot more help in getting better at that. So I want to talk to you about common sense software development. So when I'm talking about DDD, I'm not talking about the patterns of DDD. Those, those are in the design patterns books. You can learn all about that. And the whole goal here today is not to add a bunch of complication uh, to simple problems. In uh, one of the first pages of the, uh, the Red Book, uh, Von Vernon has a table where he lays out whether or not you should, thinks you should, you should use DDD or not. And I think I can kind of paraphrase that with KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. So if you're doing a content site or a brochure site, don't use domain-driven design. If you have a purely data entry site, that's what CRUD is for, create, read, update, and delete. Don't use it where maybe functional programming might work better, like a communication system. And if you go overboard with some of the things that I'm going to tell you about today, you end up with something like this, which is called the uh, FizzBuzz Enterprise Edition, which solves the FizzBuzz coding challenge in, I think, about 3,000 lines of code. Just to, just to kind of summarize, though, Domain-driven design is not the one true way to develop software. That is obviously Ruby on Rails. <laughs> no. All right. So we talk about you know, making good software. What, what, how do we define what is good software? Well, there's been plenty of books out there that talk about factors in software quality or software requirements. Um, I'm going to pick what I think are the most important five um, when it comes to domain-driven design. And that's um, correctness, testability, usability, maintainability, and modifiable. modifiability. And I'm going to compare a domain-driven design app and a CRUD app, or as the domain-driven design uh, community calls it, a big ball of mud. And it's really just a conglomeration of code that's all thrown together and basically hardly ever works. <laughs> so um, there's a big push in the domain-driven design community that CRUD is an anti-pattern. And the reason why that is 
the case is that, um, and I agree with this quote here, that a lot of times, um, you know, business people have given up on developers and developers' ability to understand business problems. Domain experts, as we call them, you know, Lord Business here, um, the people that we call product owners or stakeholders, you know, someone that knows the in and out of the business problem, uh, if that's not you, maybe if you're, you know, developing something for other developers, you're the, you're, you're the uh, domain expert. But um, when we work with these people, it, we're not just trying to deliver them code, we're trying to solve their problems. And to solve their problem effectively, you have to very well understand their problem. So when we talk to them, we need to open our eyes, open our ears, and open our brains up and listen. If we open the, uh, the blue book um, right away on page 24 of a 500-page book, uh, the subject ubiquitous language comes up. Ubiquitous means um, common across almost everywhere you're talking about it. So ubiquitous language would be common between both the developers and the business people. Ubiquitous language is really the ultimate power of DDD. It's a shared language that your development team and your domain experts agree to speak. It puts everyone on the same page. And the power of DDD is understanding the business mindset, the language, and the solutions, and understanding how to implement the business problems in code. So, DDD is not about patterns, because tools change. We switch frameworks all the time. We switch technologies all the time. It's first about listening, it's about speaking a common language, and as um, we build this common language, we'll get a better understanding of the problem and how to solve it. Let's take a quick example of building that common language. What, what does the business or you know, the, the organization that you work for call their, the people who are using the software? In the case of a, a library, they probably call them clients, customers, or members, or employees. They probably don't call them users, but yet every one of us probably have a user table or a user repository. The only people that call them, their people using their stuff users are developers and drug dealers. It, it's not that much work to take your code that has user and use the word member or employee in, it, in, in its place. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys, do you know who David Letterman is? Yeah, he's like a cranky old Jay Leno. Um, he has the famous thing he does in the United States, this top ten list. So I'm going to give you the top two that's in binary uh, reasons programming is hard. And number one, right off the bat, naming things. That is um, domain-driven design. One of the key concepts is, again, that ubiquitous language is going to help you name things. Whatever you agree with the business people on, that's what you call it. When we look at a CRUD versus MUD app, and compare that to our DDD app, you know, we have users, well, we're going to call them members. Something we had, like maybe book inventory repository, let's call that the library catalog. We have strings in a CRUD mud app, let's create objects that represent these things in our, in our code. It becomes much easier to read and understand. And I'm not picking on Laravel here, but if we take a normal um, CRUD-looking app, where you go find or fail the object, we do some where queries, we, we try to find, you know, con, uh, books that are related to that user. This, this code, if you showed this to a librarian, they would just be like, WTF? It doesn't make any sense. It's really not that much more effort to write code that is very, very readable. So instead of a book repository, we have a catalog. And instead of finding the book by maybe database ID, we use something that's more naturally expressive. Find one by book ISBN. You know, members, we have a members collection instead of a member repository. And instead of setting the, the, uh, the book relation and attaching it to a, an array inside of the object, we have a borrow function on the member. They do effectively the same thing, but in the naming, it becomes much easier to understand. Because now when you go back to look at this code five years from now, the cognitive load that's required is so much less. It's like when you learn to speak a second language. Like eventually, you stop trying to think of what is the, the word for that. So when I learned German, the first time you, you, know, you learn library, it's, it's bibliotech, but you have to think, what is the German word for library? Eventually, you get faster and faster, and you don't think like that anymore. You just start to speak in the language. And that's what this does. It eliminates that translation layer in your brain. You don't have to try to guess. You don't have to try to guess what this code is doing. 
this kind of code tells you what it's doing. And it offers great encapsulation. Now, I'm not saying you break the law of Demeter or don't follow solid principles, but code like this is easier to understand and easier to maintain going forward. Now, if you've um, settled on a language with your, uh, your business people and you're trying to form that ubiquitous language, choose the words that they use for the most part. That's going to be much easier um, to go with what they want. But you know, any one of these is fine. There's no right or wrong. It's really dependent on the project that you're working on. And I'm going to guess, as developers, if you're doing BHOT testing, you're already doing this a lot. You're already putting the, the verbs in your BHOT tests. So right there is your function names. You just haven't seen it the whole time. To kind of summarize this, this, this thought here, I think is a great quote, but the important part is here at the bottom. It says, programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute because software is incredibly difficult to maintain just because it's malleable and easily changed. Making something that is easy to read and easy to understand when you come back to it later is probably the most important job we have as programmers. So if I'm comparing the DDD version and the ball of mud crud version, I'm going to give DDD a check mark in the correctness column because it's much easier to make the software correct because you can model it properly and follow language that the business uses and directly translate the business's problems into language in the code. Um, another topic that's in the um, kind of in the ubiquitous language part of this is something called natural identification. So as developers, we often rely on primary keys and UID, UUIDs. Uh, the business does not think like that. Um, a lot of things that we're, you're dealing with, like let's say this is our library example, already have an ID. They have an ISBN number. We should be using the numbers that the business you know, relies on. If it already has an account ID, use the account ID. That's already unique, things like that. When we're modeling this ubiquitous language, um, don't pretend it's like the 1800s when you're doing this model. Uh, if you're doing it like, say, an online ticketing system, don't pretend that people are coming up to a counter and buying a ticket. No. It's ubiquitous in the sense that the technology influences the language just as much as the business problems do. It's a two-way street because, you know, as businesses evolve, obviously you're going to be changing the software to match the evolving business. And as this, the business evolves, your code needs to evolve with it, and the language needs to evolve with the code as well. OK, so if you're in a large organization uh, and you're supporting many teams uh, throughout your company, um, there's one more thing I want to tell you about ubiquitous language. And that's that when I say ubiquitous, it's not ubiquitous across the entire universe. So if you have a marketing department and a finance department or sales and production, you know, they may call those users or clients or members different things. And throughout the different parts of your system, you may want to create separate objects in order to keep the parts of the code for that part of the system separate from the others. And in one part of the system, you might call that object a lead or a payee, or maybe you know, the production team only cares that they're shipping to people, so we call that a ship to. Again, it's just about naming and keeping things separate. Because um, one of the problems that large code bases can end up in is what they call the big ball of mud. Um, Oftentimes, that's referred to as spaghetti code or shantytown code. Um, if you don't keep things separate and you start calling you know, methods all over the place, you, you'll have a problem. So in our library example, we're, we're going to set up three bounded contexts. And that's bounded context is that separation of concerns within a, a larger application. So we'll have a billing section, a loan section, which is lending out books, and a catalog section. And we're going to avoid. Um, you know, calling methods and putting objects all over the place in our, in our system. Because as things grow, and we would try to make an update to the catalog system, if that's directly depending on the billing system, we're going to have problems maintaining that. So what we're going to do when we cross these bounded contexts in these separate areas is pass messages. And the messages we're going to be passing, for the most part, are called domain events. And I'll, I'll get into domain events in a little bit here. Um, but the, the main thing here is that you're passing messages between it, whether that's an event or you know, maybe it's microservices and you're passing HTTP requests. Either way, 
try to keep your, your bounded context and parts of your system as separate as possible, as decoupled as possible. Can't stress that enough. All right. So how do we build this ubiquitous language? Well, our goal is to discover complexity on, early on. And the best process I found for that is called event storming. Now, do you have to follow this process exactly? No, you don't have to. Uh, especially if you're already an expert in the domain, uh, you probably don't need to go through this exercise. But I want to show you this because I think it's the correct manner to think about developing software. So the first thing you need to do is actually meet with the people who have the problem that you're trying to solve. The goal for us as uh, developers is to fully understand the problem. A bunch of tickets in JIRA is not an understanding of a problem. What we have to do as developers is get out from behind our cushy standing desks that go up and down and get out in the field. Now, UX professionals call this ethnographic, ethnographic research. Uh, in the library example, go to the library and see that they have a terrible Windows 98 computer running IE6. That's going to influence how you write your software. So what I'm advocating is that developers should work directly with stakeholders. We're going to ask a lot of questions. We're going to ask a lot of whys. They, they call it the five whys. So if the librarian says, oh, we need people to uh, borrow books, well, you're going to ask why. Well, because that's you know, how our business works. And you're going to ask why. And keep asking why and why and why. And usually, when you get to the fifth why, you usually find out what the actual problem is. When you meet with these people, this is what I call, uh, if you guys know the comedian George Carlin, he has the seven dirty words, which I'm not going to say, because this might end up on YouTube. But when you're meeting with a domain expert, do not use these words. They don't understand what an interface and an abstract class are. What we're trying to do here is actually figure out how we're going to address the problem. Get some Sharpie markers or some, um, you know, a whiteboard and some markers. Um, don't jump right onto the computer. Um, we use computers, you know, eight hours a day maybe, compared to the people that are, um, you know, we're working with. We're probably better at technology. We're faster. We can scroll through things faster. Um, I was in a meeting once with one of the guys that I work with, and uh, he's like, he said, my eyes are rolling back in my head. You're scrolling through stuff so fast. And, you know, that was one of the times I realized that, you know, maybe we're do going about this wrong. And that, a, you know, a low-fidelity approach, like markers or, you know, writing, uh, is approachable to anyone, whether they have any technical expertise or not. Almost any anybody can... Uh, grab a marker and draw something. Now, the event storming um, really is about getting a huge space and putting a bunch of um, stickies up. And the goal here is to try to tell a story of how the software is going to work. And we're going to start with the events that are in our system. In the library example, a book was borrowed, and then a book was returned. And the reason we're doing this is we're trying to avoid data modeling. We're trying to, we're trying to model the behavior that is in the system, not the data. Eventually, you're going to start building out more and more of a, a larger um, you know, diagram. You're going to have the people involved, the members, and the uh, librarians and stuff like that. Those are called actors in event storming. Uh, and you're going to be creating commands that go in the system, like borrow book. Those are the, the blue uh, rectangles there. And you know, as things get larger and larger, you'll, you'll start to figure out the areas that you want to split off. Like maybe the billing context here the billing system really doesn't need to know much about the book borrowing and book lending system. Uh, we can use the messages or events to pass stuff to that. So we can keep those two separate. You know, if you look at this, and maybe an event causes something to happen in that system. So an event will have an event listener, which will cause a command, which will, you know, cause this to happen in the other system. Just kind of going through the rest of it, I mean, you can flesh out, um, you know, your whole uh, story your software. And eventually, you might end up with this, this giant diagram. But this is very valuable, because you can refer to this later when you want to know how does our software look, work. Like, if, you, if you're trying to read code, that may not be entirely obvious, especially when things start firing off events and sending messages. Stuff becomes kind of decoupled and very separate and hard to understand. Diagrams like this can be very valuable. So I'm going to give DDD a double check mark in the correctness column. Because you know, I think the process of building your solution is starting with a problem and figuring out what is uh, you know, really uh, the, the thing that you need to do. And using a uh, behavior model, not a data model, uh, Martin Fowler, he says that you know, doing that, opposed to the transaction scripts that we're used to writing, is the essence of a paradigm sh shift in object-oriented programming. So if we want to model this 
um, the, th the thing that uh, DDD people call domain objects. These are the, the various things that are going to be in our code. These are value objects, entities, aggregates, and domain events. They're the primary four types. The first one is value objects. Those are the smallest things in your system. And those are going to be immutable. They have no identity. Um, things in our library example would be a book title, an amount paid, an ISBN number. Very small things. Now, contrasting that with some of the larger things, entities. Value objects have no state. They're immutable, and there's not really much to them. An entity, like a book or a librarian or an invoice, has uh, more about it. It's identif identifiable in the system. It's mutable. Things change. You know, librarians change their name. Uh, it has a life cycle. Librarians are hired and fired. Entities will contain the uh, value objects. Like a book entity will have a book title or an ISBN number. It'll, it'll contain those value objects. And an aggregate is just a, a kind of a fancy entity. It contains other entities. So a, a member may have many books in its possession, things like that. So let's start with the, the value objects. They're the smallest and easiest to understand. Um, look at some of these things in the library example. A book title, a Dewey Decimal number, date borrowed. Those are going to become objects in our code directly. So we're going to have a book title class, a Dewey Decimal number class. And the reason we do this is not just static typing. So we're not just doing this for the sake of type hinting everywhere. There's plenty of research that will tell you statically typed languages don't actually help that much when producing bug-free code. The goal here is that we're going to be reducing complexity and reducing checking throughout the system. Value objects are immutable. If you know in PHP, objects are passed by reference. So by making our objects immutable, we avoid what I consider the spooky action at a distance in objects, where if you pass an object, you're not guaranteed that that function that you called is not going to change that object. So one of the things that is probably the most important aspect of domain-driven design is that almost everything is always in a valid state. That starts with valid value objects. Value objects are like eggs. They're the very thin shell around your app that is going to solve as many problems as possible at the very edge of your domain layer. So the earlier you can handle a problem, the less you have to be defensive throughout the entire application. Value objects are also a gateway drug to test-driven development. If you're not doing test-driven development, value objects are a great way to get started doing test-driven development. Hashtag, my tests don't pass. How do we implement uh, value objects? Well, they're just plain old PHP objects, or POPOs as they're called. Um, we declare all the class properties as private. We have no setters. There's no way to change the, the data that's inside of a value object. They don't reference anything that is changeable, like a mutable object. And we throw exceptions in the constructor so that they can never be in an invalid state. Let's look at a simple example like the book title. The business rules for a book title is that a book title cannot be empty, cannot be an empty string. We have to have a book title that exists. Let's start with our tests. So the first thing we can do is start a test and to make sure that you know, we put in a book title, we get a book title back out, same value comes out. And the second one will test that you know, if I put in an empty uh, book title, we expect an exception. We run our tests. The class doesn't exist yet, so let's go create it. First thing we do is just do a simple, uh, almost like a DTO. We put the title string in, and we get it back out. That passes our first test. That was easy. The next thing we do is we throw an exception to the constructor if the title is empty. Also very simple, and that passes our tests. Light is green, tests are clean. We can move on. Let's run through another example, date borrowed. Now, to borrow a book, the, the date has to be a valid date. That's going to be pretty much handled by the date immutable class. But this library system, we're just you know, developing, developing it today. Well, I know that in my system, no date can be before May 28th, 2017. I can put that check in here. And if somebody fat fingers the number and puts something in wrong, I can throw an exception, because there's no way that somebody could borrow a book before. Or things like dates way in the future. I've had this happen many times where somebody types in the wrong number, and it ends up with a year of 9,009. That's obviously not the case. We, we can protect those kinds of things in our system. Let's so run through another value object that would be in our system, like renewals remaining. So how many times can you renew a book uh, through the library? Again, we're protecting this class in the constructor by throwing an exception if it is in a valid state. If the count goes below zero, we're going to throw the exception. Now, we can put behavior on our value objects. 
and they return a new value object. And remember I said there's, it's not mutable, so we can't just decrement the count. When the decrement function is called, it returns a new object. And when you return the new object, you can guarantee that it's in a valid state because the constructor is run. So you really don't have to look and check, is, you know, are there renewals remaining? Does this user have two, one, zero renewals remaining? You can just call the decrement function and then catch the exception. You don't have to worry about if the logic changes if, on renewals and things like that. It eliminates a lot of checking and a lot of if checks throughout your entire code base. Let's go through one more example, and hopefully this will, um, you know, just to kind of solidify this. You can use value objects that are composites of other value objects. So like a loan period for a book, it's a start date and an end date. You can pass the, the value objects that we created earlier into the constructor. And guess what? You, you don't have to do any checking. I know that if it's a date borrowed, it's a valid date. I know if it's a date due, it's a valid date. Renewals remaining. I know they have renewals remaining because it couldn't be a negative one here. It's already been validated that it's at least a zero or a one. Then I do a little bit of a check here to make sure that you know, the start date isn't before the end date or after the end date or you know, whatever, vice versa. And if that's not a valid condition, we throw an exception. So now I can, pretend, I can depend on this loan period always being in a valid state throughout my entire application. And I can do things with like math on it and stuff like that. If I want to extend the loan by two weeks, I can write a little simple function, extend by two weeks, and it you know, takes the date borrowed, adds two weeks to the date that it's due, and returns. Now, I mentioned earlier that um, you know, your behavior that's on the renewals remaining decrement function, that's going to protect this. So if somebody doesn't have any renewals left, you don't have to check are the re renewals remaining first before we, dec we extend the uh, loan by two weeks. It's automatic. That would throw an exception. You catch the exception, say, oh, this person can't renew this. It's, it's a completely different way of thinking about um, doing code. So in DDD, you know, we have things like book title, book condition, ISBN. In CRUD and MUD, most people are just using strings. Dewey Decimal Number would be an example in a library. Probably just a float. So for DDD versus the ball of MUD CRUD, the testability is much, much higher. The, Maintainability is a lot higher, and I think your code is far less brittle if you're using value objects. If you don't take any of the advice I give you for the rest of this, this talk, using value objects in the places that it matters will make a big difference in your code. Because, um, you know, let's face it, we don't all test everything. <laughs> so, what are entities? Well, um, entities, like I said, is anything in your system that is going to change over time. Like a librarian or a library may change its name. A book, a book could you know, get destroyed. So it might have state in the sense that you're going to track it, a life cycle. Entities in, are identifiable. They have an ID, like the ISBN number for a book, maybe a member ID or an account ID. They have state and they're mutable. You can change them. But again, just like the value objects, we're going to try to keep our entities never in an invalid state. So everything is going to be always valid throughout the entire system. They're going to, again, operate on those value objects. We're going to try to avoid putting um, security and permission checks inside of our entities. And the last thing we're going to try to do is make them storage agnostic. And that can get a little bit complicated, but usually most people use doctrine annotations to do that. Let's look at an example of a, a, an entity. Hopefully you guys can uh, see that in the back. But if we have our book class, um, you can see just like that composite value object, all we do is pass the other value objects into the constructor, and we no longer have to validate that the book title is not empty, and the ISBN number is valid, and the book condition is valid. And the last thing is we just generate a UUID inside of the entity to create the a unique ID for that entity. If you guys are using like active record pattern or ORMs that um, you know, use data arrays and things like that, um, you're going to be able, by passing those objects into the constructor, you avoid that check. You don't have to constantly have this um, you know, check for empty every, everywhere throughout your system. The, the getters on these entities are going to return value objects. So if you have a get book, book condition or get book title, those should return the value objects. Let's, let's look at an example of how to store these uh, in a relational database using Doctrine. Um, so we had the constructor for the book, which has the book title, ISBN, and book condition. Book condition. Um, what most people end up doing in PHP is using Doctrine uh, annotations or the Doctrine, doctrine YAML file or other ways of uh, setting up Doctrine. 
uh, but you're just going to store those um, you know, in the database. Now, the easiest way to go through Doctrine is to store it as strings. Uh, Doctrine does have something that's called embeddables, which lets you actually store the value objects directly. But that can get a little bit messy when it goes uh, a little bit too far. So I, I recommend like, casting all these variables to string and then getting that back out. But that's, it's not that bad when it comes to it. But the biggest thing I want to bring to you uh, from the ubiquitous language and to your entities is that setters are bad, OK? We don't want to have set, 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 set everywhere. I'm not going to pick on Propel. They're a fine ORM. But the problem with using an ORM is we say new book, set title, set price, you know, set author, all of this stuff. And this kind of code becomes hard to maintain over time. Because at what point is the book in a valid state? When we say the new book, it's not valid yet because it doesn't have a title. Or we haven't set the price yet. It's not till all the way down in the code where you call save. And that makes it incredibly difficult to test. The only thing here that's really protecting this possibly are the database constraints. And it's really hard to do database constraints like a date not after May 28th, 3007. That becomes incredibly difficult to try and do, or impossible. And again, we'll put behavior on our entities that actually makes sense for the domain. So if a librarian needs to look at a book and say that this book has been damaged, maybe we have a degrade function for degrading the condition of the book, or a damage function that marks it as damaged. Again, don't, don't use setters, because that just loses the, uh, the ubiquitous language or the understanding that you have in your domain. Aggregates. So like I mentioned, aggregates are a fancy kind of entity. They manage child entities, and they form a transaction uh, boundary in your database. Examples of an aggregate in the library example would be a member, because they're um, going to contain books. They are going to have books in their possession. If you have invoices in your system, that's a great example of an aggregate because an invoice contains line items, things that are entities that could change on their own that are then contained by the aggregate. So in our aggregates, you know, we're going to take language directly from our domain. If, uh, if you look at the top left, we have the member borrowing a book. So pretty easily, we're going to have a borrow function where you pass a book to it. And just for now, let's say that it just puts the book in the array. And using, like he mentioned earlier, a horrible doctrine annotation that can automatically be stored in the database. If you want to put some logic in your aggregates and your entities, that's, that's great. Um, you know, if we want to limit uh, the number of books that somebody can borrow to five, we can build that right here in the entity. We don't have to do the checking outside. So if somebody goes to borrow a book and they already have five books borrowed, we throw an exception and catch the exception. If the logic behind um, borrowing and how the limit and stuff like that, but you know, maybe this isn't the greatest example. But if that became complex, feel free to use a specification. The specification pattern is a, a well-known pattern. And you, know, you can guard for these things and try to protect that by using external classes that you bring in. And the reason you do this is for testing. It's a lot easier to test the book borrowing limit specification by itself than trying to test it while you're trying to test the entity. And I mentioned that um, entities or ag aggregate roots uh, form a transaction boundary. That is really just you know, a, a, when it comes to the database. If you're going to store a member or you're going to make changes to a member, everything that goes along with that member is going to be stored in one transaction. If you have another aggregate and it's another member, that's going to be maybe a separate transaction if it works out like that. But the whole idea is that these, these uh, aggregate roots are atomic and that they're uh, consistent all the time and never in an invalid state. So, you know, we talk about value objects and aggregates and entities um, and all of this ubiquitous language. What this boils down to is not only better code, more easily, you know, easily read, easier to maintain. I think it's also going to improve user interfaces. Because if you're doing CRUD apps, a lot of times when you design a CRUD app, you follow the CRUD patterns where you're creating, adding, you know, creating and reading and updating, deleting. So you end up with a table of things like borrowed books and you have edit and delete. Now, when a librarian comes to your, the software here to use this, she's not thinking, I'm going to come to the borrowed books part and delete a book. That's, that's not um, returning a book is not deleting a book or editing a record for the loan dates. You know, this um, ubiquitous language and this event storming and you know, figuring out this language kind of forces you down 
um, having buttons that match the uh, functions that are on your objects. So, you know, if you have a borrow function on the member, you're probably going to have a button that says borrow a book. And this is called a task-based interface, and it is a far better way to design user interfaces compared to what they call this, which is the programmer's interface, which is understandable only to programmers. So I'm going to give DDD a check in the usability column, because I think it makes software that is both easier to use for the people using it and for the developers to develop. Now, one of the things I haven't mentioned yet that I think is, you know, is very important on every app is security. And uh, domain-driven design, when they talk about security, uh, they talk about taking a layered approach. And when they say layer, they don't mean the traditional you know, layers going down. They talk about this fancy term that's called hexagonal architecture. And what it is, is it's kind of a fancy way of doing layered architecture. It's highly dependent on the dependency inversion principle. That high-level modules should not depend on lower-level modules, and that both should depend on abstractions. So when you're moving between layers in your system, you're using abstractions and interfaces. So your objects, which are down in your business uh, domain, have no idea how to render themselves, that everything is passed up uh, through an interface. So the goal here is, not to, is to avoid tying everything together, to keep things decoupled, to keep them loosely coupled. Uh, if you notice, that this red layer on the outside is very thin, and there's a reason for that. Because frameworks should not be part of your core logic. They are something that is separate. Um, code maintenance uh, beca becomes very difficult. You know, if you've watched the Office Space movie and you realize at some point you, you just want to do construction work because maintaining a legacy code base in CRUD and it's all tied to the framework and you have to do an update makes you want to just quit. You know, I, I've, I'm 33 years old and hopefully I have another 33 years uh, of development in front of me. I have no reason to, uh, you know, assume that I'm going to stop. But I feel like you know, I, spent the, I spent the first few years as a developer digging my own grave. As I was chugging out CRUD code, I had, I built a, you know, we, our team built a large application that we're now trying to support. And please take my advice and try to develop much more maintainable code than I did, uh, because you know, it becomes a huge burden. Because your frameworks you know, are on a release schedule of twice a year, say for Symfony, or Laravel, um, you know, whatever they feel like it, I guess. But, you know, that framework is changing all the time. And you don't want to have your domain logic tied to that framework and have to change your domain logic with it every time. So, you know, important to keep that, um, that separation. You know, I'm hoping that the domain logic I'm writing today could last 10, 20 years. I'm sure we're going to change frameworks five, six times in that amount of time. Just technology goes so fast. I want to mention two great talks by Matthias Reyes and uh, Uncle Bob Martin. Uh, first, decoupling the model from the framework. He gave it Laracon that's on YouTube. And then uh, Ruby Midwest, uh, Architecture of the Last Years by uh, Uncle Bob. Uh, go watch those talks. They're fantastic. So um, many uh, DDD practitioners recommend very thin controllers uh, pass off commands to a command bus and application services. I'll get to those in a minute. Um, but what I want to mention real quickly here is that uh, Following solid, if you've ever heard the solid principles, and you know, having good, clean code, and uh, depending, dependency inversion, things like that, that are very important. That really, really matters in the center section, in your domain, your business logic. It's important to keep that pure and that separate from the framework and very well architected. The outside edge, the framework code, your controllers, I think you save a lot of time by you know, treating it like the wild, wild west. Just get the job done in the controllers, but that relies on solid, well-tested business logic. You'll be able to move much faster. So, you know, I think the, the hexagonal architecture uh, and keeping your core domain business uh, logic separate from the frameworks is a uh, much better way to maintain software going forward. So I'm going to give the check mark uh, maintainability. So if we want to look at, uh, you know, how do we keep this software modifiable, uh, one of the best ways I know is using domain events. And domain events are part of the core domain. They're in that center section in that hexagonal architecture. They've happened in the past. Uh, they're probably important enough to record, so we're going we're to persist those to the database. Um, they're important enough to other parts of the system, so we're going to pass them around like messages. They are immutable value objects, just like everything else, the other value objects that I talked about earlier. They do not contain entities or other mutable objects, just like the other value objects. And if you want, you can create them in an entity, and I'll show you how to do that. <laughs> 
All right, so let's look at the uh, first one. First event here at the bottom on the uh, left, book was borrowed. We'll use that as a, an example of an event. So like I mentioned, uh, an event is a value object. They're very simple. We have the uh, value objects passed into the constructor. We know everything is valid here. There's no checking to do. Now, it, the name of it, book was borrowed, um, that's meant because it was in the past tense. Obviously, not, you don't have an event until somebody does something in a system. And when you're publishing it, it's already happened in the past. There's no setters on these. Again, they're immutable. And um, if you're going to persist this, there's one little thing you have to do, and that's just add an ID to it. And then you can use your document annotations and things like that. If you're not going to persist it, you don't need an ID. Now, let's take a little bit more complex example here. Um, this is our, our flowchart uh, for the uh, book lending uh, context. And let's assume that um, somebody has damaged a book, and we're going to remove it from circulation. So that's that bottom event. We're going to create an event called damaged book was removed from circulation. I'll bring that up a little bit bigger. Now, I know this looks like a really big, long German word, but it describes what is happening, what has happened in the past. Don't be afraid of long class names. If you, if you need more words to describe something, use more words. If you need less words, use less words. But I can't overemphasize enough that if you just called this, you know, damaged book, you, you don't know what, what is, uh, you know, actually happened. You know, is the book damaged? Do we remove? Be very, very specific when you're naming your events. So, if we're in the, you know, place we're going to charge a fine uh, for that member. Remember I mentioned having a separate bounding context from our loan system and our billing system. We're going to put in what's called a listener or a subscriber in that portion of the code. We're going to listen for that event to be published. And, you know, we're going to have um, very uh, ubiquitous language sounding functions like charge fine on member. And then we're going to publish the, uh, the event member was uh, fined. If you're using docs from an entity manager, you're going to flush your uh, domain model to the, the uh, database before you fire the events. The reason you do that is um, so other th things in the system can, again, read that data off the, the database. But more importantly, if you ever decide to change your architecture later, and because your system grows, and you need to move from your events to being immediately published to a queue, you no longer have to worry that your data is not being persisted before the event is fired off to the queue. So, um, this last line of this function here is what we're going to attack next, this publishing the event inside the listeners. If we um, do something which is called uh, recording events or event recorder, basically the, the object is going to be responsible for tracking the events that happen inside. We can easily fire the events inside of the entities. And I use a trait uh, throughout the system called event recorder. And all it does is track an array of events that happen to the object as the object is mutated. So by, by doing this, we don't decouple the fact that member uh, entity is creating these events. It's very easy to see that if you look at the member class, the events that are generated are inside of that entity. So on the outside, if, you're, if this was a controller or a listener or whatever, um, your last line of everything is just going to be whatever the entity is, get recorded events. And it's just like a, a good way of knowing that everything is working and everything has been published throughout the entire system. So using events, using something like that, instead of calling functions throughout different parts of the system, I think it makes your code much more modifiable, and I'll give the check to that. Now I want to cover two topics in domain-driven design that have somehow gotten really, really mishmashed in uh, DDD. But I don't, if you go and read stuff about DDD, you're going to immediately see these two things. And that's command query responsive segregation, CQRS, and the other one is event sourcing. Now, CQRS is... It sounds like a complicated concept, but it's, it's not really that complicated. What we're going to do is we're going to take our, our software and our code, we're going to split it in two sections, one for writes and one for reads. And when we see like, the writes and reads, we're really talking about models. So we're going to have a write model, and that was the entity as an aggregates and things like that that I've been showing you, and the read model. And the read model is probably maybe just repositories and arrays. It really doesn't matter. Do that however you want, because that's mostly going to be used for reporting, and views and things like that that don't really, um, aren't really business logic or are not core to the domain. The read models probably change much more frequently. So by, by having your uh, code split between a domain model on the right side and a read model on the read side, you know, as the read model changes more frequently, you don't have to make changes to the domain model in the more complicated business logic. Yeah, the right was the domain model. So how does like, CQRS work, um, just kind of like a, as a high-level thing? Well, 
if you're used to having controllers that do everything, we're going to split kind of where everything happens into a separate section called a command bus. And the command bus is going to have many handlers. So if you're used to event publishing, it's like having an event publisher and many things listening to it. That's, that's really what it's uh, going to happen. So as a request comes in, the controller, all it has to do is figure out that request becomes this command. So you know, if, you, if you're using Symfony and you've defined your route, your controller method becomes like one or two lines. You're, you're just figuring out, OK, this was the member borrowed book uh, route. All I have to do is generate a book was borrowed command and fire that to the command bus. So our command is, again, another value object, an immutable value object, just like the other ones. There's no setters on this. And they're very, very simple to create. Usually, it's just IDs. You're not too worried about entities at this point. So your, your controller has become super, super thin, very, very easy to uh, modify. So that controller figures out the command. It creates that object. And it publishes it to the uh, command bus. And the command bus, all it has to do is figure out which command handler do I pass it to. So let's say it passes to that. Now, usually what happens is that a command figures out a response, and maybe that gets piped up to the controller. But if you're already at this point uh, of doing CQRS, you're probably doing something that's very complex. So that may not be the case. Maybe you're doing uh, late AJAX polling or something like that. So you know, don't say that every command handler is going to return a response. That's not necessarily the case. The goal here is to make sure that our controllers are super, super thin. So that one-line controller uh, is going to be very, very important. When I mentioned that we're trying to separate our code from our framework, because now when Symfony or Laravel changes the way they do routing and controllers, it's, it's very easy. You're just moving one line to another uh, function call. I'll put the slides up online, but I'm going to put a link to this article here. It's a, a great uh, description of CQRS uh, and using command bus. But I want to caution you that um, you know, not every problem, just like I was mentioning earlier in the beginning of the talk, not every problem needs CQRS and event sourcing and a, uh, an event bus, a command bus. Um, this is a diagram I made for work. Uh, trying to describe what this architecture was going to look like. And it, get, it got kind of complex. I didn't think it would at first. Um, but you know, you, there's a lot of complexity, a lot of classes to implementing this. So you know, be cognizant of that. So really for, for co complicated problems. The last thing I want to talk about in DDD is event sourcing. Now, does anybody here play chess? A couple of people. All right, so chess matches can be described by a list of moves. You can read, if you know how to read the notation, you can replay a chess match. You know, almost any chess match that has happened in the last couple hundred years uh, is available in this notation. If you go to your bank, they're not tracking your balance uh, at each, you know, uh, by setting your balance in a database table. They're tracking every transaction throughout the system. That's how your balance is calculated. As developers, we're used to get. No, we use Git, uh, and if you know the internals of Git, it's not storing every copy of every file that you have. It's storing only the changes. That's the gist of event sourcing, is that we're only going to store the changes that happen to entities over time. We're not going to store the whole state of the entity. What are the advantages of using event sourcing versus using normal relational models? Now, uh, he mentioned earlier the object relational impedance mismatch. You basically can avoid that through event sourcing. You avoid writing a lot of data mappers, which a lot of developers hate. Uh, reduces the table counts. So if you have members, and, or say maybe the invoice example is easier. If you had invoices and line items and shipping addresses and taxes and things like that you're storing, you end up basically down to two tables. One is an invoice, like ID, and the other table is all of your events. So we're not going to store the, the properties of the object in the database. We're going to store the events, and we're going to persist them in a pen-only storage. That becomes, you know, quite easy to do. It's basically an array and events. So if you create an object, you need to push an array and events. But when we uh, have our methods that we were talking about er earlier, like borrow, like the ubiquitous language method of borrow book, all that becomes is applying the event to the object. So if you uh, put the uh, book was borrowed event in the history of that object, if you were to replay that history of that object, you would, you would know that that book was borrowed. So it's a, it's a way to uh, decouple your entity is even further from the storage. So it, it can be an advantageous for that. Again, just like the CQRS, it's a little bit more complicated, so I don't advise it for every project. There's a couple of libraries that will help you uh, do event sourcing uh, easier, and I'll put those there uh, on the slides so you can see them. If you want to learn more, you know, all the books are out there. Um, there's a great group of guys that, uh, did a and ladies that did a dev book club. Uh, they went through the Red Book chapter by chapter and talked about it. 
couple of great podcasts. Uh, that podcast, Full Stack Radio, Elephant in the Room, all talking about domain-driven design. The Domain-Driven Design Conference from Europe posts all of their videos and talks online, at least most of them, and uh, you know, they're all fantastic to watch. If you want more of a workshop, there's the IDD workshop, which is done by the guy who authored the Red Book. Uh, there's a GitHub repository that's a state of the union uh, that have, you know, great things that are happening in DDD. And there's a Google group um, out there that is absolutely fantastic. There's tons of information on there. Um, but all those things are going to be in the slides. You guys can go find them. I want to leave you with one more thing in domain-driven design. And if you've ever heard of this, uh, it's called the Manifesto for Agile Software Development. It's at agilemanifesto.org. When I mean Agile, I don't mean Jira Agile. I mean actual make software that is developed in an Agile manner, meaning it's responding to change. They have a couple of um, you know, key tenets that they promote. And they say individuals and interactions. Now, are over processes and tools. For me, for domain-driven design, that means meeting with domain experts and building a ubiquitous language, not trying to do out UML diagrams and things like that. Working software. We, need, we don't need documentation if software is easy to read. Just like that code that I showed you earlier, you don't have to try to decipher it. It is easy to read. Customer collaboration. Again, that's building that ubiquitous language and not trying to you know, do spec after spec after spec after spec to try to define your software. Build that event, stor event storming session. Build what the software is supposed to do. That becomes your spec. And responding to change. That's easily modifiable code, code that is decoupled from our frameworks code that uses domain events and passes messages, and is easy to couple. You know, I think following some of the practices of DDD, if you don't do everything that I talked about today, um, will make your software much more agile, you'll be much more successful, and hopefully make way, much more mo way more money. So, uh, the talk is on joined in if you'd like to rate it. I copied some of these topics. Um, I didn't really leave time for questions, but I am happy to answer questions uh, later uh, on the lobby or over a beer. So, thank you. Thank you.